Today we're going to look at a, just a beautiful passage about being uh, the Good Samaritan or, or being really a good neighbor. I, I think that God wants us all to learn what it really means to be a neighbor. It's not about uh, living by a set of rules or regulations, but it's about walking in grace. And as we experience God's grace, God's grace in our lives, it's about allowing the world to share that grace with us. It's us giving that grace, extending it to people we see, to people we meet, to people that we come into contact with. You know, last week as we closed uh, the message, we saw that the disciples came back rejoicing. There were 72 that Jesus sent out, and they were doing works, and they came back rejoicing. And Jesus said that you shouldn't be rejoicing because of all these things or because the demons bow down to you or that you have power. You should rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Because that was the focus. Well, after they rejoice, we see this joy that fills up Jesus. That Jesus, all of a sudden, after, you know, they're rejoicing and he he corrects them. And then we see him experience this awesome joy. The Bible says in Luke 10, 21, in the same hour. So after he rebuked, corrected, and taught his disciples, he was filled with joy. In the same hour, he rejoiced. In the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Jesus was full of joy through the Holy Spirit. Luke frequently mentions the Holy Spirit's ministry in Jesus' life, showing us that even though he was God, he submitted himself as man to the power of the Holy Spirit from his baptism on. When the Holy Spirit descended on him, he submitted himself and walked just like we walk so that we could have a perfect example to follow, how to live in submission to the Holy Spirit, how to do the will of the Father. The other awesome part of this is you see the Godhead. All three persons are mentioned here. They're clearly seeing Jesus, the Son, is doing the Father's will in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we see the Godhead working together, and each person in the Godhead has a specific function. They work together, but they each have their own role. Jesus was full of joy because the Father's revelation to him of the elect. You know, he had chosen them, he had given them Jesus, and Jesus was joyful and he makes this statement about them being children the people that were following jesus were not important people of that day you know they weren't like the top officials they weren't the ranking people but they were important to the kingdom and he considered them as wise and learned because they weren't wise in the world's eyes they weren't learned in the world's eyes but they were wise because they were following jesus they came to him like little children entering the kingdom And so the Son revealed to him the Father. And then he says in verse 22, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal. So so Jesus chooses those, so he's also following for those that God gave him and those that he chose to reveal the Father to. Nobody can see the Father unless Jesus reveals the Father to them. It's part of the process of salvation. We call it the pre-sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit draws us in, opens our eyes that we might see who God the Father is. And as the Holy Spirit is doing that, Jesus is actively at work dying for our sins. He died for our sins. The Holy Spirit draws us to the cross, and we see the Father. And then we can be reconciled back, and Jesus is full of joy because of the Father's revelation to the Son and for the reality that he has given him authority over everything and that he is making him known. Verse 23 says, Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. The disciples were living in in probably the greatest time of all. In the most opportune day. Because the Messiah was 
It was there. Presently, physically, and kings and prophets had longed to see the Messiah. But they didn't get to see him. But these followers, man, they were eyewitnesses. They were touching him, handling him. They were in his presence. I mean, they were in the day of the Messiah. They were walking with him and talking with him. And so these ambassadors were really privileged to see what other people had never seen, to hear what others had longed to hear but could not hear it. The Messiah was at work, and they were a part of that work. I mean, can you imagine how awesome that must have been? To be with Jesus physically? I mean, we're with Jesus spiritually. He lives in us. But we're not walking with him. We're not asking him questions. We're not spending every hour of every day with him. And they did. So they were truly blessed. And Jesus was joyful for those that the Father gave him. And for those that he revealed the Father to. In the midst of all this, Jesus is filled with joy. He's sharing with the disciples. And you get this one guy, you know, like out of nowhere who pops up and wants to test Jesus. So we see the testing of the Savior. It's like out of nowhere, this guy just pops up. And that's how life usually goes. Everything will be going good. You'll think everything's falling into place, everything. And then all of a sudden, something will pop up. Something will come out of nowhere, and it'll smack you upside the head. You're like, what? Where did this come from? How did this happen? But it does. And so we need to be prepared for the unexpected because the unexpected is our reality. I mean, the one constant that is always true is that everything is always changing, always, all around us. Whatever you experience, it's all, you're never going to go through the exact same day twice, ever. Your experiences, the people you run into, the things that you do will always be different. So we have this consistent inconsistency that is always there. But the other truth that is always a reality is that God never changes. In the midst of everything changing, God is always the same. Today, yesterday, and forever. So we hold on to that truth in the middle of all this chaos. That God is always the same. In the midst of this, you know, joy, this guy pops up, and I love the way Luke starts it. And behold, like out of nowhere, here comes this guy. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? Now, it was expected that rabbis would discuss theological matters in public. They did it all the time. And the question the scribe, which is a lawyer, asked was one that was often debated by the Jews. You know, it was a good question asked with a bad motive. Because the lawyer, the scribe, was asking this in order to trap or test Jesus. But Jesus flips the script on him. He turns it around and puts him in a position where he has to do the answering. So, Jesus sent this man back to the law and asked him, how do you read it? How do you interpret it? He sends him back to the law, not because the law saves us, because the law could never save us, but the law shows us that we need to be saved. There can be no real conversion without real conviction. And the law is what God uses to convict sinners. Romans 3.20 says, for by works of the law, No human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The law reveals to us that we can't keep the law. When the speed limit says 55, you got to go 58 or 60 or 75 or 100. It doesn't matter. When we see a law, our natural propensity towards a rule is to break it. We want to push the limits. We're sinful by nature, so the revol- the, the law reveals our sinfulness. It's pretty simple. So the lawyer answers, and he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. The lawyer wants to entice Jesus into a theological debate. That's what's going on. He's trying to draw Jesus out. He's trying to use eternal life. 
What is the necessary aspects or things that we need to do to have eternal life? And instead of just answering the question, Jesus directs the lawyer and asks him for his point of view. What do you think is the answer? And the lawyer responds by citing two Old Testament passages. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5, Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. Eternal life is inherited when one loves God with the totality of one's being and one's neighbor as himself. So Jesus agrees with this response. But then he forces the discussion into the practical realm. He wants to take it a step farther by saying, do this. Don't just talk about it. Just don't understand it. Do this and you will live. Now some have thought, that Jesus was only speaking hypothetically because the answer would contradict salvation by faith, not by works. So people have believed that Jesus was speaking hypothetically, but he wasn't. That's an incorrect interpretation. Real faith, saving faith, always manifests itself in works. It always does. You're not saved by works, but when you're really saved, there are good works. Ephesians 2.10, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Saving faith always produces good works. You're not saved by those works, but because you are saved, works will flow. The lawyer wants to justify himself. So he says in verse 29, but he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So the scribe, you know, he gave the right answer, but he would not apply it personally to himself or admit his own lack of love for God or his neighbor see if he would have admitted his own lack and not tried to justify himself he could have fallen on the mercy of God and just said I I can't do this I that's what the law does it shows us that we can't keep it so we fall before the mercy of God and say God I need you but instead he tried to justify himself He tried to wiggle out of his predicament that he had put himself in. And he used an old debating term that has been used for centuries. The tactic, define your terms. So he's, define your terms. You know, what do you mean by neighbor? Who is my neighbor? So he asked Jesus to define the terms in this conversation. So the lawyer's attempt at self-justification realistically is probably stemming from his realization that he is not fulfilling the twofold commandment. To love God with all that he is and to love his neighbor. So that leads Jesus into this parable, which is probably one of the most profound and meaningful parables in the New Testament. The parable of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to read through the whole parable first and then explain it to you. Because I really want to make sure that we have a a clear understanding and interpretation. I want to give you a hermeneutical interpretation of this parable. uh, Not by allegory but by fact. So let's go through the story. Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Now, this is a magnificent parable. Parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But the worst thing that we can do with any parable, especially this one, is to turn it into an allegory. 
All right, now hermeneutically, that's not the way we're supposed to interpret scriptures, but it's been done for centuries, and there are a lot of similarities. So we turn it into an allegory, making everything stand for something else instead of looking at it at face value. I mean, I've heard it taught, I've read about it. The victim, you know, is heading down to Jericho, which means he's running away from God, you know, in the allegorical sense. He's leaving God, he's going down. He's not going in the right direction. And the victim is the lost sinner. He's half dead, right? He's been beaten half dead. He is physically alive, yet spiritually dead. He's helpless on the life, on the road of life, just laying there. The priest and the Levite, you know, allegorically represent the law and the sacrifices, neither of which can save. So the Samaritan becomes Jesus. The Samaritan is Jesus Christ who saves the man. He meets all of his needs, he pays all the bills, and he promises to come back again. So allegorically, you can see how people have, have you know, made this into the story. The inn, it stands for the local church where believers are cared for, where they're safe. And the two denarii, or the two ordinances, you know, baptism and communion. But if you take this approach to Scripture, you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. You have to understand that when you interpret Scripture, you have to interpret it hermeneutically. It doesn't mean that there aren't similarities. And yeah, it sounds great that all these things can represent all these other things. But there's nowhere where we know that that's what Jesus is pointing to. And I think that when you do that, You're in danger of missing the real message that God is trying to display through the text. And so what I want to help explain is the text, the way I believe Jesus meant for us to understand it. Now, allegorically, yes, it's a great analogy, right? You can say, wow, all this stuff, it it just falls into place. You know, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was down, definitely. Definitely. It was a 17-mile stretch that was a steep decline. It descended 3,300 feet. I mean, for 17 miles, that's a serious drop. Jericho is 770 feet below sea level. It's a lonely road, which is a prime place for robbers and thieves and people who want to take advantage of you. And most of us can make up or think of excuses why the priest and the Levite ignored the victim. I mean, you know, maybe we've used these excuses ourselves when we see somebody in need or we see somebody hurting, you know. I mean, the priest, he'd been serving God all week long in the temple, right, doing the work of God. He was probably anxious to get home. He was probably tired. He'd probably been ministering to everybody. He was probably overwhelmed. And so, you know, he sees this guy on the side of the road, and he's like, you know what? Somebody else will do it. I've done my fill of work. I've done my job. I've got too much on my plate. I need to go home. So he passes by on the other side. Well, the Levites, they served in the temple too. They were assistants to the priest. So these are all religious, spiritual people. And the Levite comes down the road, and, you know, He sees this guy there, and maybe he's thinking to himself, you know, he's bait. If I go out there, there's probably more guys lurking in the dark waiting for me. You know, hey, it's not my fault that this guy was attacked. It's not my responsibility. You know, so I just need to get home. Somebody else would do it, and he did exactly what the priest did, nothing. He did nothing. The priest left it up to the Levite. The Levite did exactly what the priest did. He did nothing. And such is the power of a bad example. And we need to realize that in our lives that people are always watching us. The examples we set for our kids, for our friends, for our coworkers, the way we live our lives, people are always watching us. And our example needs to be an example of Christ. Now understand this, by using the Samaritan as the hero, Jesus disarmed the Jews. 
the Jews and the Samaritans were hostile enemies. So the Samaritan being the hero just blows the minds of the Jews. It's not a Jew helping a Samaritan. It's a Samaritan helping a Jew who had been ignored by his fellow Jews. The priest and the Levite are fellow Jews who ignore their brother on the side of the road and an enemy comes along and shows compassion. The Samaritan loved those who hated him. He risked his own life because there could have been bandits waiting, lurking, you know, using this guy as bait. So he risked his own life. He spent his own money. Two denar- was two days wages for a laborer. Two full days of wages. He was never publicly rewarded or honored as far as we know. There was no thank you. Just did it because it was the right thing to do. So what the Samaritan did helps us to better understand what it means to show mercy. What it really means to love your enemies. It also illustrates the ministry of Jesus Christ. It shows us what Jesus did for us. The Samaritan identified with the needs of the stranger and had compassion on him. You know, Jesus stepped out of heaven. And he came to lay down his life for us when we were his enemies. He didn't owe us anything. We didn't deserve anything. But he gave up everything. There is no logical reason why the Samaritan should rearrange his plans, spend the night, spend his own money to help an enemy. There's no logical reason for that. But mercy doesn't need reason. Hear me. Because this example is the example God wants us to set before the world. See, this is an illustration. Not just a great story. Not just a a typology or an allegory. It's personal. It's applicable. It's about us being the neighbor. It's about us loving our neighbor. It's about us being an example of the world of who Jesus is to us. In the same way. Now, remember, the lawyer, the scribe, is an expert in the law. He knew the law. The scribe knew that God required his people to show mercy, even to strangers and enemies. The Old Testament teaches in Exodus 23, verses 4 and 5. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 and 34. And Micah chapter 6, verse 8. That we should love our enemies and be kind to strangers. That we should show mercy. Jesus wisely flipped the script. He turned it around on this lawyer who was trying to evade responsibility. I mean, that's one of the issues for us is we're always running from our responsibility, right? If we'll be responsible for the choices we make, for the things we do, if we'll own who we are, then we can fall on the mercy of God and say, God, man, I need you. Because I make so many mistakes. I do so much wrong. I just can't seem to get it together. Lord, I need you. I need your mercy and God will give it to us. You see, the man wanted to know who is my neighbor. But Jesus asked which of these three men was a neighbor. Not who is my neighbor. Who was a neighbor to the victim. The biggest question The real question is, to whom can I be a neighbor? To whom can I be a neighbor? And am I being a good neighbor? Because this has nothing to do with geography, citizenship, or race, or denomination. Wherever people need us, there we can be a neighbor, just like Jesus Christ, and show mercy. The lawyer, you know, wanted to discuss neighboring in a general sense. But Jesus forced him to consider a specific man in need. And how easy is it for us to talk about abstract ideas and fail to help to solve concrete problems? We can discuss all day long things like poverty and job opportunities. We can talk about it like the best of them. But never personally help somebody find a job or never personally feed a family 
You know, the lawyer, he wanted to make this a complex issue, a philosophical thing. But Jesus made it simple and practical. Because living for him is simple and it's practical. He moved it from duty to love. From debating to doing. Now Jesus isn't against or condemning discussing things or debating things. He's not condemning that at all. But he's warning us not to use these things as excuses for not doing or for doing nothing. It's easy to talk about the hungry. It's easy to talk about the homeless. It's easy to talk about those in sin. It's easy to talk about people who have messed up their whole lives. It's easy to talk about jobs. But unless we're willing to help people find jobs, to make better choices, to find food, then we're doing nothing but talking. You can read this passage or this story and see the high cost of caring. It cost this guy his time. It cost this guy his money. And what did he get in return? You can say nobody honored him, nobody rewarded him, nobody cared. But that's not true. The Lord cared. The priest and the Levite, they lost far more by not caring. They lost far more by their neglect than the, Ser- the Samaritan did by his concern. They lost the opportunities to become better men and better stewards of the gifts that God had given them. They could have grown in their faith. They could have grown in their love for God. They could have grown in their love for their neighbor. They could have been a good influence in a bad world. But they chose to look the other way. I think often we do the same thing. The the Samaritans' one deed of mercy has inspired sacrificial ministry over all the world. The Samaritans' purse, Mother Teresa, who was caring for the homeless until she died. I mean, it's inspired many, many acts of love and mercy. And let me tell you something. You can have all this theology. I mean, your, your head can be so full of theology but not practically live any of it out. And it does you no good to have all this knowledge if you're not applying truth to your life. I mean, if you're not loving God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, if you're not loving your neighbor as yourself, what good is theology? I mean, we need good theology. Don't get me wrong, because good theology brings good lifestyle. I'm all about good theology, but I'm all about practicing the truth. And I believe that's the message in this story. It's about living the truth showing mercy and compassion and love to our neighbor, being the good neighbor. And I think, you know, you have to remember, it's all about your perspective. It always depends on your outlook. The thieves, I mean, to the thieves, this traveling Jew was a victim to exploit, right? They saw him, they seized the opportunity, they beat him, they took his money. To the priest, And the Levite, he was a hassle. He was something to be ignored. And so they avoided him. You got any people in your life like that? Man, you just want to get away from them. You're just like, oh, man, they're just driving me crazy. You see him coming, and you walk the other way. You're like, "Uh oh, (laughs) here I go, Uh oh. Did he see me? You know, you're like. The Samaritan was a neighbor. And he loved and he helped and he took care of the hurting man. And there are a lot of hurting people in this world. A lot. At this time of year, man, we can show love, real love to people who are really hurting. It can be a witness, a testimony, a picture of Christ to the world because people are suffering. There's more depression, more fatigue, more anxiety at this time of year than any other time of the year. From Thanksgiving to Christmas, there's more suicide than any other time of the year. The loneliness, 
the depth of depression and hurt when everybody else is gathering with family and loved ones and you have nobody. And people are hurting all around us. We just have to open our eyes and look for opportunities to be Jesus to them, to represent Jesus, to really be his ambassadors. What Jesus said to this lawyer applies to all of us. He says, go and keep on doing it likewise. That's the literal translation. Go and keep on doing it likewise. It's the literal translation. We should be going and doing and loving and sharing and helping, pouring out our heart and our lives and open opening up our homes or whatever we need to do to make a difference in this world. The lawyer asked, who is my neighbor? But that's not the question that we need to ask. The real question that we should be asking is, am I a neighbor? Am I a neighbor to my fellow man, to all those around me? to those who are broken and beat down by this world. Because let me tell you something, this world is filled with people who are broken and beat down. And they need somebody to pick them up. And you can be like the priest or the Levite. He said, it's not my responsibility. It's not my fault that they got mugged or beaten or broken. It's not my fault. I didn't do it. I didn't make bad choices. I didn't walk down the road all alone. So you can look at it like that, and you can avoid them because they got issues. Or you can extend the hand of grace and mercy and say, let me help you up. Let me love you right where you are. I'm not talking about enabling because there's a big difference between enabling somebody who makes bad decisions to keep making bad decisions and helping somebody to make real change. But the first step is you have to know them. If you don't know them, you can't help them because you don't know whether they're making bad choices or whether they're just falling under bad circumstances. You don't know what they're going through if you don't ask. You don't know what they're experiencing unless you share. And that costs you time and energy. It takes sacrifice. Sometimes we're just so wrapped up in our own lives that we don't have time for anybody else. That we're so consumed with our stuff that we're not looking up, and then we're not looking out. But just the whole picture here, it's about looking up and looking out. Jesus was filled with joy because of his relationship with the Father. And then he told a story about our relationship this way. It's a perfect picture of the cross. It's always about the cross. It's about loving God and loving people. And if you love God, you have to love people. You can't say, I love you, Father, and not love your neighbor or be a neighbor. Because you're only deceiving yourself. If all your energy, if all your time, if all your wealth is spent on yourself, if it's just about you, then you're not loving God and loving your neighbor. If you're not serving anybody, caring for anyone, praying for anyone, I mean, what's your prayer life look like? Is it really all centered about, God, I'm just going through this. God, I need this. God, I need that. God, can you help me make it through today? Is it all about you? Because if it is, get your eyes off yourself and start praying for all those around you. Lord, I just want to pray for this person. And I want to pray for my brother over here. And God, my sister's struggling. She's depressed and she's hurting. And man, she's going through the hardest time of her life. So God, I'm asking that you would give her peace and that you would give her joy. God, that you would pick her up and that you would bring people into her life to encourage her. And let me be one of those encouragers. God, let me be your feet. Let me be your mouth. Let me be your hands. See, that's what it means to walk like Jesus. That's what it means to be an example to the world. Because the world is always watching. And they want to know, where is this Jesus that we talk about? He lives in us, right? He's the hope of glory. He's in us. So I want to challenge you. I want to really challenge you to be the neighbor to get your eyes off of just yourself and to look around you. Just a little act, man. Just give somebody a phone call. 
Just make a visit. Send a card with some encouraging words. Look for opportunities to pick somebody up. And then when you're, you know, alone, and you're like, oh, I'm bored. Man, get on your knees. Don't be bored. Use the time that you have, and you're like, oh, I got nothing to do. Are you guys, there's always, when people say, I got nothing to do, I just want to, are you kidding me? There's always something to do. I got nothing to do. Yeah, you get on your knees. You got free time? Wow, what a great way to use your time. Get on your knees and start praying for all your brothers and sisters. Get in the word. Meditate on it. Let God fill you with his grace and mercy. Don't say I got nothing to do. There's always something to do. Because we should be about his work. Amen? We should be about his work. Not our work. Not our dreams. Not our desires. Not our ambitions. It should always be about what he's doing. And it's tough, I know. It's tough because life is hectic and life is busy. So open your eyes. Let God's love fill you up till it oozes out of every pore of your being, till His love just oozes through you and the world sees it because that's how He's glorified. Will you pray with me? Lord, it's my prayer that your love would fill me up first God that I would be a living example of your love to this world of your grace God of your mercy that you would give me the wisdom to discern between enabling and helping God that you would give me the strength to be your hands and feet and mouth and then I pray that for my brothers and sisters here this morning God, that we would become your vessels, that together we would make a difference for your glory, for your namesake, God, that the world might see Jesus, that you might display your love before this world through our actions. Help us to get our eyes off ourselves. God, teach us to focus on you for your glory and for your namesake. In Jesus' name, amen.